Hi there, I'm Joanna Anderson from Project Art in collaboration with the Detroit Public Library. We're here at the Heidelberg Project and uh, we have a special guest, Janine Whitfield, who's going to read our story today and also share some thoughts about Heidelberg and some of the themes in the book. My name is Janine Whitfield and I am the proud president of the Heidelberg Project here in Detroit, Michigan. And I'll be reading my book entitled Yarrett Nutyug. And the book is really the alter ego of the artist Tyree Guyton, who created the Heidelberg Project in 1986. In a big city called Grebla Day lived a young boy named Yarrett Nutyug. Yarrett was a different kind of boy who liked to do unusual things that other boys his age did not think were fun. While other boys liked to play sports and video games, Yarrett liked to go hunting. But Yarrett didn't hunt for insects or animals. Yarrett liked to hunt for trash. Here he comes. Okay, on the count of three. One, two, three. Trash boy, hey you old junk collector. Where you going to find some old smelly garbage? The neighborhood kids teased. Humiliated, Yarrett lowered his head and kept walking. You see, even though Yarrett hunted for junk, he still wanted to be part of the cool kids crowd. He wanted to be picked to play basketball at recess. He wanted to have someone special to make jokes with. Yep, keep on walking, junk boy, the neighborhood boys yelled. Yarrett's head hung so low, he could see the cracks in the sidewalk. Come on, let's get out of here, he heard one of them yell. Let's let the junk collector get his junk. Yarrett stopped walking and watched as the boys disappeared. He wanted to yell for them to stop. He wanted to let them know there was more to him than collecting junk. But the words stuck in Yarrett's throat because deep down he knew that what he liked most of all was collecting interesting old stuff. Still, he was very lonely and wished he had a friend to join in his adventures. Yarrett started his journey behind an alley in the neighborhood where he lived. It was here, among the old abandoned burned houses and vacant lots, that Yarrett would find the most interesting things. It thrilled Yarrett to search through the debris of the vacant lots and old houses. To Yarrett, the treasures he found were more than junk. Many of the scraps Yarrett found were rotted, burned, and sometimes almost destroyed. But Yarrett didn't think of them that way. To him, the... Yarrett, Yarrett, Nut Yug, are you daydreaming again? Miss Lopez exclaimed. Um, no, no I'm not, replied an embarrassed Yarrett. Then stand up and tell the class what you want to be when you grow up. Um, mm, I don't know yet. Maybe a baseball player, mumbled Yarrett, looking down at his desk. Ah, ha, 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 the other kids roared with laughter. A baseball player? Yarrett, the trash boy, couldn't hit a beach ball with a bat. Yeah, he can't even dribble a basketball or throw a football or do anything except collect smelly old junk. Yarrett's going to be a garbage man and smell like trash. The kids hurled insults one after another. As Miss Lopez struggled to regain control of the children, Yarrett suddenly dashed out of the classroom. Yarrett, Yarrett, not you, you come back here. You come back here right now, yelled Miss Lopez. Yarrett, do you hear me? You come back here, exclaimed Miss Lopez. But Yarrett was gone. Outside the school doors, Yarrett ran as fast as he could. He ran back to the place where he could be free, back to his safe place back to his abandoned houses and vacant lots. Wiping his teary eyes with his shirt, Yarrett thought, what's wrong with me? Why don't they leave me alone? What's wrong with finding life in old stuff? Why can't they understand that anything can be something if you believe it, even me? Why, soon, a solemn Yarrett drifted off to sleep, nesting comfortably on a heap of cardboard behind an abandoned house. When Yarrett awoke, his eyes still hazy from sobbing, he thought he saw an old man standing about 10 feet away. Yarrett blinked his eyes several times to refocus, 
But again, he saw the old man standing very still, looking up to the sky. The old man had a long gray and white beard and was dressed in every color of the rainbow from top to bottom. Yerrick got up slowly and walked over to the old man. Who are you? A puzzled Yerrick asked. Why, my name is Color, the old man softly replied. Color? Yerrick replied. Yes, Color, and I'm here to paint your world. Come with me. Yerrick eagerly followed the old man. Where are we going, Yerrick asked. To another world, replied the old man. It seemed to Yerrick as though they had walked for hours before they finally came to an old abandoned house. This house was unlike any house Yerrick had seen. The house was, wow, who made all of this? exclaimed Yerrick. Why, I did, of course, answered the old man. Can we go inside? Yerrick asked. This is why we're here, my boy. But first you must look very closely at the outside of the house and tell me what you see. Wow, I see everything. All the things I have ever seen in my whole life. Wow, I mean, I see old, new, big, and small, all different shapes and sizes and colors and more colors. And the old man began to laugh. Come, my boy, let's go inside. Stepping inside the big old house, Yerit saw even more cool things. Old, torn and worn, burned, smashed and crashed, big and little, tall and small. Just a whole bunch of everything everywhere. Yerit was in heaven. He hurriedly explored everything. It was as if his hands were on fire. He began to maneuver his discoveries by moving them around, stacking them, taking them apart, and putting them back together in different ways. He discovered an old can of paint. Soon, Yerrick began pouring paint over the objects and moving the objects in the paint as if they were dancing. He found more things, more paint, more dancing. <laughs> the objects came alive and soon the whole room was a colorful explosion. Yerrick began to laugh wildly, covering himself in paint from head to toe. Come, my son, it's time to go. I don't want to go, replied Yerrick. I don't ever want to leave this place. I love it here. It's magical. I want to live here and paint. And the old man laughed with sheer delight. Who are you? Yerrick asked, as if he were suddenly aware of the old man for the first time. As I said, my boy, my name is Color, the old man answered. Yerrick grew impatient and he said, I know your name, but where did you come from? Where do you live? I am you and you are me. I live inside you, Yerrick, the old man replied. Huh? Yerrick questioned. Yerrick, my son, you must go back and tell the truth. You must have courage. You must tell the whole world but more importantly, you must always remember to be true to yourself because everybody has a special talent or gift to offer to the world. Huh? A puzzled Yerrick replied. Ouch! Yerrick shrieked. Yerrick looked around to see what hit him. Above the pile of cardboard where he lay, Yerrick spotted a stray dog burying a bone under a pile of rocks. Oh, I guess it was that rock that hit me, huh, Color? Yerrick turned and saw no one. Color! Color! Hey, old man, where are you? Yerrick screamed. There was no answer. Yerrick stood up and looked around. He wondered what had happened to the old man, his friend, someone who understood him. Where was Color? What's going on? Was it a dream? Yerrick played it over and over in his head as he walked home. The boat on the outside of the house, the swirls of paint, Color's coat, his beard, his laugh. Yerrick was saddened by the loss of his friend. Hmm, some friend. He wasn't even real, Yerrick grumbled. Up ahead, Yerrick spotted an old beat up paint can. Hmm, I'll just put this with my other collectibles. Yerrick picked up the old paint can and began to walk faster. 
It was starting to get dark and the street lights would be on soon. If I don't hurry, I'm going to get it, Yerit thought to himself. The wind was blowing ferociously and Yerit began to run when he noticed a crumpled photograph fly out of the paint can onto the street. Yerit kept running and so did the photograph, as if it were chasing him. It's following me, Yerit thought. Finally defeated, Yerit stooped down to pick up the photograph. He uncrumpled the photograph and saw an old man and a little boy. Hmm, Yerit thought. He turned the picture over. On the back of the picture it read, My son, always be true to yourself. Wow, it's color, it's really color. He is real, it wasn't a dream. He's real, he's real. Yerrick quickly stuffed the photograph in the old paint can and hurried home. Once home, Yerrick hid his treasures in a spider-webbed corner under his bed. The next day in school, Yerrick bravely asked Miss Lopez if he could tell the class what he wanted to be when he grew up. Miss Lopez, surprised at his enthusiasm, replied, Of course, Yerrick. My name is Yerrick Nutyug. One day I'm going to be a great man and change the world. I'm going to be an artist. So I just want um, children to understand and appreciate that you're learning and you're reading about a live artist that you can still see and meet today. And an um, artist who was born and raised right here in the city of Detroit. We also want you to understand and appreciate the ways in which you can use your imagination and also learning new words and also being true to yourself. So those are some of the uh, comprehensive questions in the back of the book that we'd like you to think about as well as some important themes and new vocabulary words. Such words as ferociously and maneuver. Those are words that we'd like you to look up and learn more about. And some of the important themes that we want you to think about are bullying, friendship, self-acceptance, and empowerment. And then we want you to look up Tyree Guyton and see what you can learn about the man today. Hi there, I'm Joanna Anderson and I'm with Project Art in collaboration with the Detroit Public Library. We're here at the Heidelberg Project with Janine Whitfield and uh, she have a fabulous book here that we've read and uh, we're going to ask her a couple questions about Heidelberg and about the book uh, that's just been published. Thanks so much for taking the time to be with us. Um, I wonder Thank if you. I could ask you a couple questions about the book and also about Heidelberg in general. And um, mm -hmm. We have had a wonderful opportunity to speak with our students uh, throughout the library system with Project Art and many of which have seen Heidelberg and, and come many times and we're excited to ask you uh, some questions and have the opportunity to see some responses from you. So Very good, um, I'm excited to share. Great, thank mm -hmm. you so much. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we had a question from a young student wondering where did all this stuff from Heidelberg come from? Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, actually the work or the assemblages or elements of the canvas come from cleaning up the city of Detroit, most of them. Um, so the artist basically just collected the refuge and the debris that he found within the community and he used it and reconstructed it, reconstructed art pieces from the debris. But also we receive things because the project is so well known now, we receive different additions or different elements or relics from people from all over the world. Wonderful. And is it, is it finished? Is it ever changing? And it's never finished. Never the finished. Heidelberg <laughs> project is like an evolution. But there was a point in time, we're 35 years old, so there was a point in time where you know we've had a pauses, we've had demolitions, we've had fires, um, but it is like a baton passing. In other words, we're looking at the next generation of young Tyree Guytons now, which is kind of how the book came about. So we see the Heidelberg Project really as just a living art museum that's always changing and always evolving. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, I wondered if um, you could let us know when the artist uh, started his sculpture, when he started his collecting, and um, from those collections, when he started to really see it as art and, and uh, his passion. Well, actually, some of those elements are already in the book where 
It was his grandfather that gave him a paintbrush at the age of nine, and he said it was like his hand was on fire, and he knew he wanted to be an artist, although he tried to do other things, like he was a firefighter, and he also was in the military, and um, then he ended up working for Ford Motor Company, but he, he never forgot that paintbrush in his hand at the age of nine. So it was in 1986 where he was looking outside of his home and there was an abandoned house and that's where it began. He began by cleaning up the lots in that abandoned house in his community and one house became two, became three giant art sculptures and that became known as the Heidelberg Project. And does he have collaborators that he works with on this or is it all his work? Well, most of the collaborators that helped him to originally create the Heidelberg Project are grown up now. So um, we occasionally have artists that come in and contribute. It is pretty much, though, done primarily by Tyree, but we currently have an artist in residence now, and we're starting that as a program because the artist is getting up in age, and he's not going to continue to climb on top of houses and things <laughs> like that. So it's changing, mm -hmm. and it's growing, and it's exciting, yeah. So, wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, I guess to that end, what does this art mean to Tyree? Mm, that's such an important question. Um, let me put it like this. The idea of using discarded and found materials is symbolic of how we often discard people and communities. But what happens when you pick these things up, dust them off, add color, you breathe new life into these things. So every work of art on Heidelberg Street, though it may look like it's just this big junkyard, has a meaning. And I'll give you a couple of ideas. There is um, an, a work of art where shoes are hanging from the tree. And the artist's grandfather helped him to originally create the Heidelberg Project. And he asked about lynchings in the South. And he asked him if he could see the people. Well, his grandfather recalled lynchings in the South, and Tyree asked him if he could see the people, and he said he could see the souls. So the bottom of our shoes are called souls. So, but that's the history. The more upbeat side of that is that we're lifting up the soul of the community through this work. And that's why it's so important for children, because they learn about symbolism, and they learn how you use one thing to help give meaning, artists, to give meaning to something. Very, very educational in that way. Mm -hmm. And what do you think, uh, you touched on it a little bit just then, but what do you think the impact of this art has, has made on this neighborhood and in Detroit in general over the last three decades? Oh my gosh, <laughs> listen, we have, there are about 195 countries in the world. We have signatures from visitors from over 144 countries. We became the third most visited cultural destination in the city of Detroit. Um, and that was without the benefit of government funding or real support, you know, because it was so different. Um, but the impact is felt around the world, where we've had people do projects uh, based on Tyree's theories in places like Pakistan, um, in, uh, over, uh, I don't even know if I can say it, in France, and places all over the world. Unfortunately, it has been in Detroit where we've had the most difficulty with acceptance. Mm. But that recently changed just in 2021 where we got a Lifetime Achievement Award issued through the mayor and the Department of Cultural Affairs in the city of Detroit. So what you're really looking at though is true innovation. And I think that what we're trying to do is use art as a way to change a neighborhood that has historically been discarded. Mm -hmm. I, if I could mention the book a little bit, um, Reet is really focused in, in trying to overcome some of these bullies that he is uh, faced with. Yes. And I wonder um, beyond that if there's been uh, resistance to the art um, that's been shown for, for decades out there in, on the Heidelberg Street. And, um, you know, I can see them as sort of potential bullies mm -hmm. <laughs> in a way. How have, how have you reacted? How's the Heidelberg reacted? That's very powerful because absolutely, the Heidelberg Project has been the subject of heated debate, controversy, political potato. I mean, all of that. From neighbors who didn't understand why he would use trash, you can understand that that would make them feel 
like maybe he's mocking them. But instead, it was to cast an international spotlight on the neglect of a neighborhood and a community. So overcoming those things really are, um, the artist has kind of taught us that you have to stand for something. And even though it might get hard and get tough, or it's, we have to use this example, um, when you're washing clothes in a washing machine, the process to get those clothes clean is called agitate. So that's what we would call a metaphor for when things get tough, you just have to stand. You have to stand and walk through it because it helps you to grow as a person. And that's what I think the message of what Heidelberg is sharing with not only children but adults too, because a lot of times they need the message more than the children. Mm -hmm. Could you speak a little bit to the relationship between our main character in the book and the artist? Yeah, this is, um, when I first met Tyree Guyton 28 years ago, he told me some stories that were fascinating. They were so fascinating that I began to record them. And a lot of the stories had to do with him as a young child. When his grandfather put that paintbrush in his hand and what it felt like for him to want to do something that was diametrically opposed to what young boys were doing at that time. So I think that um, the relationship is telling the story of his adventures because this is one of three books that'll come out. It's I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a trilogy because I've gotta talk about when he built a clubhouse and his clubhouse was made from old found materials. And, um, and so it just, it just is really bringing his voice as a child that moved him to this international artist today, bringing that voice to life for young people so that they can muster up their courage, so that they can understand that when you walk through life, sometimes you have challenges. That's why we have problems to solve, mm -hmm. not to run away from. So all of those really powerful messages are contained in his life growing up, and that's what I was hoping to capture in the books, or in this book and the books to come. We're excited for those to be released, for yeah. certainly. Um, I have a question from one of our young artists who says, what made you make this book and how were you feeling when you made it? That's a, uh, another good question. Let me just say to you that when I, I wrote my first poem when I was 18, and then I wrote my next 275 after I met Tyree Guyton. And what he says is that there's an artist in every one of us. So he helped me to tap into my own creativity. I write, I like writing, I write on a more scholarly level, but there's a kid in me. And there's this wonderful, exciting um, example or demonstration that the artist performed with me when he asked me if I would help him. And I said, no, because I don't understand what you're doing. And so he blindfolded me and he gave me paint and crayons and markers and sat me on the floor <laughs> and gave me a piece of paper and said, now paint what you see. Well, I couldn't see. And it was such a, a, free, a, a, a type of freedom from that because I was not inhibited. And that's a powerful message. And so it awakens something. That's the power of art is that it can awaken the artist in every one of us. And I think a lot of us go through life doing things that we think we're supposed to do. But when you're doing something that inspires you, it's timeless. What do you hope, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, but I, I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit more about what you hope that um, young readers across Detroit and beyond would um, take away from this. Yeah, there's a lot of themes. You know, I see Heidelberg as a microcosm for the whole world. Um, it's just loaded with thoughts and ideas about how we are, who we are, humanity. And I think in raising children today in a world that's kind of gone mad, we really got to dig a little deeper and we can't just be surface anymore. So we want to bring out ideas of what it feels like to be humiliated. We want to help children to channel that energy in a positive way. So it's not just what's on the surface. For Heidelberg, what's on the surface should cause you to ask questions that make you dig deeper. 
Surprisingly, kids were the biggest champion of Heidelberg. It's like a big old playground, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I re we really hope to bring out that kind of thought process and energy with young people. It's not just a story, it's your story. Somewhere you're gonna find yourself in this, this book. Yeah. A seven, one of our seven-year-old young readers and artists says, quote, I think that it was really sweet and wise when color taught Yuri, don't care what other people say and follow your dreams. I wonder what advice would you give to youth who are feeling like they are going through some struggles and trying to fit in and also trying to find what their special talents and their special gifts are to give to the world? Well, that's seven. a loaded question. That's a seven-year-old? That's a seven-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is, wow, that is loaded. Well, that's, and it would take a lot of time, not really, to answer that question, but, um, let me just say that going back to some of the themes with Heidelberg, what, what the artist did with the big Dotty Wadi house was that he called that house the new White House. That's really the title of it. And the idea is visually, it's in a way where all people should be or could be able to relate to the White House. The messages that we send sometimes can set tones that make people feel a certain way. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to create in such a way that you would find yourself in the Heidelberg Project. You would find, you curate your own experience. Mm -hmm. So basically what I'm saying is that giving children the freedom to be, not to act, but to learn how to be, and then helping to channel that energy. So if a young person is saying like, I'm being bullied or, or feeling like, someone is that they don't have the courage to step up and or be courageous for, for example those feelings come from a process of talking through these concepts and ideas encouraging people and young people to express themselves whether it's through art or through conversation those are all mechanisms and that's what we're interested in so it's a process. It's a process through visualization. It's a process through conversation. But it really is going inside the individual and teaching kids how to be as opposed to how to act. You know, I think in Project Art, we are constantly trying to give students the tools to be creative and show that they have all that power within themselves already. Mm -hmm. they can just let it out and find, find that. And we can't always stand in judgment of it because there's a lot of influences right now and a lot of confusion for young people. We're really committed to young people through this work with the Heidelberg Project. In closing, I want to thank Janine Whitfield for taking the time to write this amazing book and to share some thoughts about Heidelberg and uh, some of the wonderful themes that we found throughout the book. We are certainly grateful for her time and uh, this experience. Thank you.